Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Dr. Hilary Geiser. I'm an, I'm an optometrist and assistant professor of optometry at the New England College of Optometry. And I practice here in Boston at the Charles River Community Health Center. So today I'm going to be doing uh, the first part in a series of three lectures on binocular vision testing. Um, first, before I get started, I just want to thank you for the say thank you to the Orbis team for the opportunity to pre present today and for all the support from Dr. Sarah Wozniak, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Gaitre Srinivasan for their permission using the videos and their help in assisting me with this lecture today. So I said um, today is part one in a series of three lectures. Today I'll be covering introductions to tests used to assess the function of accommodation and virgins and analysis of normative data in the test results. Part two is going to be an introduction to common binocular and near common near binocular vision disorders, how to identify these disorders using common binocular vision testing, and I'll also be discussing cases and giving examples of common binocular vision disorders. In part three of my lectures, I'm going to be in doing an introduction to common techniques to manage common vision binocular vision disorders. So today's lecture objectives, we're gonna, I'm gonna teach you how to do an introductory battery of binocular vision testing procedures, and we're gonna gain an, an introductory understanding of the theory of each binocular vision test. And at the end of this um, lecture, I want you to be able to, confidently con be able to confidently conduct a basic binocular vision exam. So I'm just going to ask the audience um, how familiar are you as a provider with completing a basic binocular vision assessment? Do you perform these regularly? Have you learned them, but you're not confident in applying them? Have you seen them, but never actually learned them? Or do you have no knowledge of binocular vision tests? So I see the large majority are you are fairly um, use basic binocular vision testing quite frequently with some um, not so familiar. So that's great. I hope this lecture is very helpful for you today. So what is functional binocular vision? The whole goal of having a good functioning binocular vision system is to have clear, comfortable, single vision when using both of your eyes. This is determined by a balance between the patient's refraction, FOIA position, virgin's ability, and accommodation. Any imbalances in these systems can negatively impact the patient's quality of life. There's an imbalance, maybe convergence insufficiency, say, patient might not be able to pursue higher education, may have trouble reading, things like that. So what are indications for um, binocular vision testing? So any abnormalities may be noted on binocular vision screening procedures during a standard comprehensive exam, for example, cover tests or stereo vision. Maybe the patient is symptomatic for visual fatigue, headache, they're having symptoms such as fluctuating vision or difficulty focusing, maybe some intermittent double visions. All of these are indications for um, binocular vision testing. Binocular vision abnormalities are very common and can infect all ages. They're considered non-pathological. They're considered an anomaly in that they're non-sight threatening, but they can significantly impact patient's quality of life. I touched on this briefly just a few seconds ago, but quality of life concerns include school, work performance, hobbies, and general visual discomfort. So when I'm thinking about a core binocular vision exam, a very basic introductory binocular vision exam, what do we need to be looking at? So the very first step is to determine the need based on case history or possibly a previous diagnosis. We must always, always, always start out with an accurate and current max full plus refraction with binocular balance. We don't wanna do a binocular vision exam 
with some, on someone that simply might need a pair of glasses and might be symptomatic because they need a pair of glasses. We should always measure the magnitude and direction of any phorias, rule out any tropias at distance and near, and look at the ACA ratio, which I'll cover in more depth later. We should also assess the positive and negative fusional virgins using both direct, and we can use, also use indirect methods. I'm just going to be covering the direct methods today. We should also be able um, to be able to assess the convergence and accommodative amplitudes, and ideally evaluate sensory status and any potential suppression. So today I'm going to be going through and teaching you how to do the cover test to look at a FOI or a tropia, and doing virgins testing using step virgins with prism bars and also the near point of convergence. Also be looking at accommodative amplitude, testing accommodation, and looking at something called the ACA ratio or the accommodative convergence to accommodation ratio. Be also looking at sensory status and suppression and testing this with a stereo vision test. And again, I can't stress this enough, must always start out with an accurate and up-to-date refraction. So just a word of caution before you start doing your binocular vision workup, just be careful, careful to take a full patient history to rule out any possible pathology from something that's more functional in nature. So for example, any headaches that don't, do not correlate with binocular vision anomalies, maybe the patient's waking up with intense headaches, having nausea, vomiting, these don't make sense with the headaches that, that occur more as a result of reading all day, might be more that might be more linked with say something called convergence insufficiency just always be able to take be careful to take a full patient history also highly recommended to complete a dilated ocular health assessment first just to be on the safe side usually um, we'll do some more basic binocular vision tests maybe we're thinking there's an issue they have a full comprehensive dilated eye exam and then come back for more binocular vision testing if needed and again always an updated and accurate glasses prescription. So I'm gonna be going into our, our first topic of the day, covers. We're teaching you the cover, uncover, and alternating cover test to rule out a foria versus a tropia and get a better understanding of the patient's eye alignment. So what are forias and tropias? Aphoria is the position of the eyes when binocularity is disassociated. This is sometimes referred to as the eye's resting position. Disassociation eliminates fusional virgins for the patient. You can do this in a couple different ways, either occlusion or prism. And this essentially disassociates the eyes by presenting images that are unfusable. And then the eyes go to that resting position. In contrast, atropia is a misalignment of the eyes when a fusible image is presented. So patients should be able to fuse this image, but for whatever reason, they are not. A word of caution or of note, since binocularity is impaired in patients with strabismus or atropia, you often cannot perform binocular vision testing because the patients are not binocular. So just always remember that if you're doing your cover on cover tests, finding atropia, probably won't be able to measure virgences in PC and the other testing I'm going to present today. With that said, there is a caveat that it's important to remember that tropias can be variable by the time of day, length of testing and near work. So again, careful case history. If it's a more intermittent tropia, you might be able to perform some um, binocular vision testing, you may not. So cover test procedure. The purpose of this test is to determine if a patient has a foia or a tropia and the characteristics of that tropia when present. Its objective can be formed quickly and easily on most patients. This is a very good screening test. It's done in almost every comprehensive exam. 
And this test can also be used to measure the ACA ratio. And I'll again go into more depth with that later. So one of the crucial components of the cover test is controlling accommodation. We need to select a proper target. So accommodative, accommodation affects virgins, which then affects eye alignment. So there's that near triad of pupil size, convergence, and accommodation that are linked. So our eyes converge, accommodate, and our pupils become smaller. All those three things are linked. So to control accommodation during the cover test, we need to choose a properly sized target, have the patient attend to that target, and keep it clear. So it's just very important when you're performing this test to stress, can you see that target? Can you keep it clear? You might have them keep reading the next um, letter if they're doing this test at near. For children, there's often lots of little targets where they can see little animals and you can ask little questions about that. Oh, what color is the chicken? What color is the alligator? And things like that. The reason we want to do this is because that can change under or over accommodation can change the Fourier position. For example, under accommodation will overestimate an exophoria and over accommodation will underestimate an exo. So just be aware that it's important to constantly keep stressing, can you see the target and keep it clear. So what targets, what are our options for targets? So for distance and near target um, cover testing, we use that accommodative target. We're going to select a target size around 20, 30. That for a patient that's 20, 20, that's usually one to two lines above the best corrected visual acuity in the poor seeing eye. So if your poor seeing eye is say seeing 20, 40, we're going to have to select a target that's more 20, 50, 20, 60. Um, it's ideal to keep the fixation target isolated, particularly at distance. This is a great distance target here. We're isolating the E. We, again, need to always stress that the patient keeps the target clear. Here's some near sticks here at the bottom with more pictures that you can use on children. I also have an example here that you can use with the different letters and a different um, target size. So you might have them focus on one letter there at the bottom when you're performing this. You can also have them read the rest of the letters so you're ensuring that they're keeping the target clear. So how do we set up this test? The patient is going to wear the habitual correction for the distance you're testing. So their distance glasses, if they take those glasses off when they're reading, that's how you want to test them. Or if they wear glasses full time, you want to have them wear their glasses all the time. Um, you're going to be eye level with the patient and behind the target as much as possible for near testing. Um, so it's ideal if you're doing this test or right behind it, you're watching the patient's eyes. For the distance target, you don't wanna get in the, in the way of the target, so you need to be off to the side, but still as straight as possible. And we always need to have good lighting to maximize contrast on the target and to pick up any small ocular movements. So first step is the cover uncover test. We're always going the whole purpose of this test is to determine which eye is fixating. So how do we perform this test? We're having my patient look at the target. I'm going to pretend I'm looking at a target in the distance. You're going to cover the right eye with the paddle pausing for three full seconds. One, two, three. You're going to uncover and watch for the eye to move the fix to fixate. Again, one, two, three. Good. We're going to repeat that procedure twice before switching to the left eye. If neither eye moves on that cover uncover test, then we're going to proceed to the alternating cover test. So some examples here on the diagram. So we have our patient here just looking at the patient. They look like they might have a eye that's a little in here on the left, an eye that's a little out here on the right, uh, on the left as well here at the bottom. 
This is more of an esotropia. This is an exotropia. And we go to do cover tests. So we're covering the right eye. When we cover the right eye, we notice that there's movement out of that left eye. So that eye was in, it's moving out. So that means that I was an esotropia. Here at the bottom, we're covering the right eye. When we cover that right eye, this eye that was out previously is now moving in to fixate. So that means it was out moving in to fixate. That was an exotropia. Here at the bottom, we have a patient that looks a little bit more ortho to start with. We're covering um, the left eye here. And whenever we uncover that eye, the eye moves out. And so that means the eye was in. And here on the bottom is just the reverse. We're covering the eye. When we uncover it, the eye is moving in. That means that eye was out previously. This takes a quite a bit of practice. Just watch which eye is moving out. If neither eye moves, that means both eyes are fixating on the cover uncover test and the patient does not have atropia and we're going to move to the alternating cover test. So on the alternating cover test, what we're going to do is we're going to move the occluder quickly between the two eyes while keeping each eye individually covered for three seconds. This is going to keep the eyes disassociated disrupt that fusional vergence and allow the eyes to go to their Fourier positions. So it's gonna be one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, three. And we're gonna watch for any eye movement. So the eye that is not occluded is going to fixate on the target, while the other eye will go to its Fourier position. So see here we have two eyes straight ahead. Covering the left eye, you can see behind this little magic occluder here that the eye is a little bit in. When we move that occluder over to the right eye, this eye right here is moving out a little bit, so that means it was in, it's moving out. We're covering this eye, we can see again behind my magic occluder that this is in. When we move it over to the left eye, that eye goes out again. This eye is in again. So essentially when we're covering it, the eye is in, that's its resting position because it's disassociated, and the eye flicks out when it's uncovered. So they're flicking in, they're working together, and four is, both eyes are moving together, and this is an example of an esophoria. So if thinking about cover analysis, if an eye moves to fixate during the cover uncover test, then that patient has atropia. For atropias, we need four different components. We need the laterality, left, right, or alternating. Since it's always in the left eye, is it always in the right eye? Do you see uncover uncover test, the eye moving out in the left or in the right? That's more of an alternating um, laterality. We also need to know the frequency is that tropia always there or is it intermittent? Also need to know the magnitude, which you can do by two methods. You can neutralize with prism bars or loose prism lenses. And when you get more experience, you can also learn how to estimate the magnitude. We also need to know the direction. Is it hyper, hypo, is it exo, or is it eso? So if the eyes do not move during cover uncover, but do with the alternating cover test, that means we're dealing with a foria and we only need two components when we're recording and looking at a foria. We need the magnitude and the direction. So I'm going to show you a video on the cover test procedure. And I'm going to talk you through this. So again, your patient's wearing the habitual correction, a good accommodative target, one line larger, one to two lines larger than the patient's worst VA. You can also use your hand as an occluder if your patient's a child. Here's our target. We're going to perform the cover uncover test first.
Here's our patient. We're doing this test at distance first. So cover, uncover, no movement is noted. Again, we're switching to the left eye. Cover, uncover, at distance, no movement is noted. So now because we didn't see any movement on the cover, uncover test, we're going to go to the alternating cover test. So cover one, two, three, cover one, two, three. This is the alternating cover test at distance. Again, no movements noted. Oh, maybe a slight movement there, but so very slight exophoria at distance. So we're going to be doing similar procedure, but at near now. So again, we're gonna use an accommodative target at 40 centimeters with good illumination on the target. We're gonna be doing the cover uncover test first. And we see how the eye is moving in. That means it was out behind the occluder. We're gonna do this on the left eye now. And also note how that eye is moving in, which means it was out behind the occluder. And this means that the patient has atropia, so they have an exotropia that is alternating because you would see it in both the left and the right eyes. Cover, uncover, test again. That eye is moving in. We're now going to be doing the alternating. And each eye is moving in on alternating. That means the eye is out behind the occluder. So she has a moderate um, to large exophoria. Now we're going to be doing the test with the patient's habitual correction. And if we note on the cover uncover test, there is now no movement of that right eye. And again, we're doing the cover uncover test on the left eye and there is no movement with habitual correction. And on alternating cover test. Again, there's no movement with the patient's habitual correction. So this patient has an alternating exotropia uncorrected, which is fully corrected when they're wearing their appropriate glasses prescription. So when we're doing cover tests, we want to know the magnitude of the foria or tropia, and we're going to neutralize this with prism. A quick and easy way to think about this, how to measure it, the base is where the eye moves towards and the apex points to where the eye is in the foria position. And we're no longer gonna see movement on alternating cover tests when the deviation is neutralized. So say I have an exo, I'm gonna hold my base in. I would alternate and keep moving up until I no longer saw any movement. We can also do this with the cover uncover test to neutralize the Fourier atropia. Um, prism bars have base in for horizontal, and we also have prism bars with base up for any vertical deviations. 
So I highly encourage you to practice that. You can also use loose prism lenses. And so the amount of prism, when there's no longer movement, is going to equal the magnitude of the deviation. And just interpreting movement or thinking about movement, if the eye moves into fixate, that means the eye was out, E with 40 or tropia, that's an XO. We're going to measure that with base in. If the eye moves out to fixate, that means the eye was in, we use base out to measure. If the eye moves down to fixate, that means the eye was up or hyper. If, for example, this is in the right eye, we're going to be using a base down in that right eye to measure. On the opposite side, if the eye is moving up to fixate, that means the eye was down. For right eye, we would measure with base up in the right eye. So I'm, I just want to ask you a question. On cover test, you note that on the cover, uncover portion of the test, the patient's left eye always moves into fixate when the right eye is covered. When the cover uncover test is performed on the left eye, the right eye does not move into fixate. How would you describe the patient's findings? Good. Majority got that it was a constant left exotropia. So it's constant. It's always there. But it's a tropia because we're doing the cover uncover portion. It's not an exophoria, it's an exotropia. Great job. So when we're thinking about the normative data and recording of cover tests. What is normal? So a distance anywhere between one prism diopters of esophoria to three prism diopters of exophoria is normal. Near ortho to six prism diopters of exophoria is considered normal. Tropias are never normal. So to record, we need to know SC is also a, is an abbreviation for without prescription, or CC is a, an abbreviation for with prescription, or you can write without or with. We also need to know which, through which prescription you're testing. Are you testing with habitual or maybe you're testing with a new updated prescription for today? You need to know the test distance, is this at distance that are near? The direction, magnitude, if it's euphoria. For tropias, we're going to add in laterality and frequency. So for an example here at the bottom, we have cover test with glasses at 40 centimeters. We found approximately a four prism diopter of esophoria. This is just an abbreviation for esophoria. It's perfectly fine to write it out as well. For a second example, cover test without correction at distance. We have a five prism diopter exotropia abbreviated XT. Just a note, um, usually the little tilde here is used for approximate. That means we just observed it and estimated it where the little delta stands for being measured. You can also write estimated or measured. That's also correct. What are some troubleshooting for running into problems with cover test? Sometimes we have to repeat the, if a patient's symptomatic, but we're not really seeing anything, say they have the complaint, oh, little Johnny, their eyes turns in the evening, you're doing the exam, but you're not really seeing anything. So you might have to repeat that multiple times. You might even have the patient come back at the end of the day, or we might repeat it at the end of the exam if, that lar if the large FOIA is noted at the beginning because it might break down into atropia. Maybe it's more intermittent in nature. The patient has good control of it most of the time, but upon fatigue, that FOIA breaks down into atropia. And again, I mentioned this before, but you can also have the patient read letters to ensure that they are indeed keeping the target clear. We're going to move into vergence testing and cover two techniques, near point of convergence or NPC 
and step vergences. What is vergence? Eye alignment that depends on the balance between fusional vergence and the patient's foyer. Essentially, we're thinking of supply and demand. We have a foria, that's the demand. We have vergence, which is the supply. Vergence is the movement of the visual axis, axis towards or away from each other in order to keep images single. So convergence is towards each other, divergence is away from each other, hypervergence of one eye and hypovergence of the other eye. The eyes work like this and they work like this. There's two types of uh, vergence that we're, I'm going to discuss today. Fusional is stimulated by retinal disparity and accommodative is simulated by that accommodation reflex. And remember our near triad or our synkinetic triad of convergence, accommodation, and pupillary response. Here's just an example of convergence. Here's an example of divergence. So what do I mean when I'm talking about convergence, supply, and demand? Again, demand is exo, my eyes are out. I'm gonna to have to use compensating convergence or possible positive fusional vergence to bring my eyes in to keep them aligned. What about if my natural position of my eyes is ESO, ESOphoria for example, I'm gonna need compensating divergence or negative fusional vergence in order to keep my eyes aligned. And the exact same thing for a right hyper, I'm gonna need right hypovergence. And if I have a right hypo, I need right hypervergence in order to keep my eyes aligned. So in context, what can happen? So a patient has no motor fusion, no fusional, um, not able to use their virgins, they're gonna have a constant strabismus. My patient has intermittent motor fusion, they're gonna have more of an intermittent strabismus or potentially a decompensating phoria. Maybe my patient has motor fusion, but there's difficulty or discomfort maintaining it. So they can compensate for that phoria, but it's difficult and they're symptomatic. Call this a symptomatic phoria. What if the patient has comfortable motor fusion? And if the patient has comfortable motor fusion, we typically assume that they're gonna have a normal phoria. So the first test I'm going to cover with the virgins testing is near point of convergence or NPC. The purpose of this test is to assess the absolute convergence limit. This is important in diagnosing a very common binocular vision disorder called convergence insufficiency. This is both an objective and subjective test. So the setup for NPC is shown in this picture below. Patient needs to use their habitual correction or the prescription through which you would like more information about the absolute convergence limit. Say you found a large change in prescription, maybe one to two diopters. You wanna make sure that patient's gonna be comfortable, so maybe you put that in a trial frame and test your NPC again through it. We have different targets we can use. We can use our accommodative target like we did in cover test. We can use a light or non-accommodative target. This is good for presbyopes. We can also use a red lens to add an additional barrier of fusion and use the, the light as well to perform this test. All three are perfectly fine methods to use. So the NPC procedure so you're going to move the target towards the bridge of the patient's nose and ask the patient to tell you when the target appears double. You're gonna observe the patient's eyes for any loss of binocular fixation. This is known as the break point. If the patient reports double vision or diplopia at any time, this is known as the break point. And we should observe and record the eye that loses fixation in either case. So once the target becomes double, or an eye loses fixation, then you're going to move the target away from the patient again and ask them to tell you when that target becomes single again. You're gonna record this as the recovery point. If the patient does not report to blow at any point, but you as the provider note that an eye loses fixation, 
then they are likely suppressing and you're going to have to record the eye that's out and that they're suppressing. So make sure you measure the break and recovery point with a ruler. You can estimate as you gain experience, but it's good to use that. Um, a lot of the near cards now have little rulers on them that you can use right here. So I'm going to show you a video of just the NPC procedure. So bringing the light target in. At some point, we're going to note that that left eye is going to, oh, there it is, it broke. And then bringing it back until she recovers. And you would, and you would record, um, measure and record the distance and which eye went out. So when we're recording, we need to record the test used, so in PC, and the type of stimulus used. Did we use an accommodative target, a light target, or red lens. We need to know with or without correction and with correction which prescription and we need to record the break or recovery. You can use centimeters or inches. Diplopia per patient report, that's the more subjective portion of the exam. Or suppression if the patient lost binocular fixation but did not report diplopia. We also need to know which eye lost fixation. So here are some examples of recording near cover, near point of convergence, with correction, accommodative target, break was six, recovery was 10, diplopia was noted, and the right eye was out. Again, on the bottom here, second example, near point of convergence, corrected with the light target, break was eight, recovery was 12, Suppression was noted in this case, and the left eye was out. So thinking about near point of convergence in context, what can happen? What are our different outcomes? So first case, the patient maintains binocular fixation, never reports diplopia. You don't see the eye out. The patient can follow the target to the bridge of the nose. We record this as TTN or to the nose, no break point is noted. Second scenario is the patient reports diplopia and you observe the eyes lose binocular fixation. So your observation should match the patient's report. And again, that break point is when the patient reported double and you saw them lose fixation. And then the recovery point would be when they would report single and you would observe that they have gained fixation. What happens in our third scenario here? You observe that the eyes lose binocular fixation, but the patient does not report diplopia. This means that the patient is potentially suppressing the deviated eye, or they might not understand the test. This is very common in younger children. Again, we need to record the breakpoint or when the patient lost binocular fixation. Sometimes we're going to use this test in more of an objective method. We're just going to record the eyes out. This is often all that we have for children. So what are our norms? So for an accommodative target, break and recovery. Break is around five centimeters and recovery is seven. This is the least receded near point of convergence because it engages both the accommodative and fusional virgins. For pin light target or light target, a little bit more receded because we're not using, it's a non-accommodative target. We're not using our accommodative system to help us with our convergence. Break is under seven centimeters, recovery under 10. If we repeat this test with the red lens, this might suggest an even more significant convergence problem and we see more recession. Any failure of the patient to report diplopia as the eye turns out, indicates suppression. Some troubleshooting that we can do. If NPC is more receded, we're gonna think the patient potentially has convergence insufficiency and we need to evaluate more. What happens if the patient has symptoms, they're coming in with complaints like fluctuating blurry vision at near, maybe an eye turn, things like that but you're finding a normal initial near point of convergence and you're like, what's going on? 
So may, we might have to repeat this test multiple times. Five times is just recommended to assess for any fatigue. We can also repeat this test at maybe the end of the exam as well. Or we can repeat again with that red lens, red lens on the right eye using that light, light source um, to add another barrier to fusion and we might find that the NPC is more receded. So I'm going to ask you another question. So you are performing near point of convergence on a six-year-old child, and you know that the right eye loses fixation around four centimeters and recovers at seven. The child does not report that the target has doubled, however. What is the most likely assessment of the patient's findings? Nah, so I tricked you a little bit in this. Number one, totally correct. But number four is also really likely. It's a six-year-old child, so maybe they don't understand the chat test. So we're not able to 100% definitively determine suppression or diplopia, so we're gonna rely on objective findings. However, if the six-year-old child was now a 16-year-old, 100% number one would be the correct answer. Not necessarily wrong, but just think about the patient you're working with and when this test might be need, you might need to use this test a little bit more objectively. So I'm now going to use, I'll go into virgins testing using the step method with your prism bars. So this technique measures your fusional virgins. We're going to introduce prism under binocular conditions to test the patient's fusional virgin's ability. The prism is going to create retinal image disparity. It's going to move those images away from the focus of each eye. It's going to stimulate our fusional virgins. So your patient's going to, we're going to introduce prism. And the patient's going to move their eyes until their supply of virgin's innervation is depleted. Because accommodation and convergence are linked, the patient's first going to use up their supply of accommodation convergence. They're going to report blur, and then they will use up the rest of their fusional virgins and report double. So we do both base in, base out. You can use base up and base down as well. I'm just going to cover lateral virgins testing on this lecture today. So we're using base in, base in, light's gonna to deviate to the base of the prism. Images are gonna move nasally on the retinas and the patient's going to need to diverge to keep the image on the fovea. When the patient's diver diverging, this is going to test negative fusional virgins. And base out, exactly the opposite. Base out, the images are gonna to move temporally on the retinas. The patient's going to converge to keep the image on the fovea and this tests your positive fusional virgins ability. So when testing virgences, an easy way to think about is the corneas are going to turn towards the apex of the prism. So the purpose of step virgences is to measure a patient's ability to maintain clear and single binocular vision while changing virgins and holding accommodation constant. Again, can't stress the importance of this enough, we're going to use an accommodative target at a constant viewing distance. This is a free space technique, so we're only going to be using prism over one eye. There is a technique that you can do in the phoropter called smooth virgences, where you put in prism equally before each eye and add the two prisms together, but we're just going to do the free space technique today. This is subjective and objective test. It's subjective because you're asking the patient to report when the target becomes double, and you're also observing for the patient to lose fixation. Just a caveat, a patient must be able to fuse in order to measure fusional virgences. 
So you can't do this on any patients that are exhibiting atropia. So how do we perform this technique? Again, we need habitual correction or the correction through which you want virgin's information. We can test both at distance and near. We need to use an appropriate near and distance target, an isolated line or letter, one to two lines above the best corrected VA and the worst seeing eye. We're going to place the prism bar base in before one eye and move it step by step as the patient attends to the target. And you're going to ask the patient to report when the target becomes blurry, breaks into two, and comes back into one. So if the patient, maybe you're working with a young child, for example, if the patient fails to report, report blur, break, or recovery, you're gonna watch for the patient's eye to flick off the target, and you're gonna record that as your break point. When the eyes come return to their initial position, that's going to be recovery. So you're gonna repeat, we've done base in first, we're gonna repeat doing base out prism. We always perform base in before base out because we wanna avoid any potential prism adaptation. So I'm gonna show you a video of the step virgins technique. So she's moving the prism, she's attending to the target. At some point, the eye is going to flick. Oh, so it's full of flick there. One more, yep. Not maintaining fixation. So she's going to go back, and then she has maintained um, resumed fixation. So you would record the amount of base in prism, for example when you note the break, and then the prism number when they may, um, resume fixation. What are our values? Don't have normative values for blur. This is adapted from Scheinman and Wick, but we have some normative data for break and recovery. Something that I want you to be aware of that I'm gonna to touch base on today, but I cover more in depth in part two of my binocular vision lectures, is Sherrod's criterion. So Sherrod's criterion says that the patient is going to be likely not symptomatic if they have at least twice the compensating fusional virgins, twice their FOIA's worth of compensating fusional virgins. So say I have a FOIA of 10 XO, as long as I have at least all right, six XO, as long as I have enough compensating fusional positive fusional virgins of 12, I should be okay. Again, I just wanna introduce this topic now. I cover this more in depth in part two of my lecture. So just a little bit more advanced question, but I still wanted to ask it. On positive virgins testing base out, you record the following findings. So you find on base out that there's no blur, there's a break at 15 and recovery on seven. On cover test, you find the patient has a five prism diopter exophoria. Do you expect this patient to be symptomatic? Excellent. So no, we don't expect them to be symptomatic. Number two, because they have five, they have 15 positive fusional versions. I'm going to go next into a clinical test of accommodation. I'm only going to be covering AMPS today. What are our indications for test and accommodation? Any reduced near visual acuity, especially in a non presbyo or any symptoms that suggest a potential accommodative anomaly, such as blurred vision, fluctuating near vision, increased distance blur after reading, headache or eye strain after near work, 
Any fluctuating vision not associated with a health risk factor, such as dry eye, this is why I can't stress the importance enough of doing a full, complete dilated ocular exam before we do a binocular vision workup. Also, I just want to touch base on pseudomyopia. Again, I cover more binocular vision anomalies in part two of my lectures, but introducing this topic now. Pseudomyopia is any visual acuity that suggests more minus than ret refraction, or retin refraction is finding more minus than entering VA. Say they're reading 2020, but you're noting maybe minus one or minus two. Doesn't really correlate those two findings. We think there might be pseudomyopia, might be an accommodative issue, and we need to follow up. So there's lots of different categories of accommodation testing. I'm going to cover amplitude of accommodation because it's really quick, easy to do, more screening, doesn't require any specialized equipment other than the targets that you're also using for near point of convergence and cover test. Um, so that's the entire amplitude of accommodation. We can also look at relative accommodation using a technique called NRA Puree. This is done in the Proctor. There's also the accuracy of accommodation using MEM, which is with the retinoscope and a fused cross cylinder or binocular cross cylinder in the phoropter. And also can look at accommodative facility or the speed of accommodation. I will cover one, the one that's underlined and five. I will also be looking at the link between accommodation and virgins. This is really more of a virgins test. I'm just listing it here. So amplitude of accommodation testing, we're going to be using the push-up method. The purpose is to measure in diopters the patient's ability to change focus in response to a near stimulus. This is a subjective and it's a monocular technique. Patient's going to wear their near habitual prescription or the prescription through which you want more information. We must always re record through which prescription we're testing. The target needs to be a well-illuminated row of letters, one or two lines larger than the near visual acuity. We're going to test each eye separately. We're going to instruct the patient to keep the letters clear, slowly move the chart closer to the patient, and ask them to report when the letters first become and stay blurry. So the first sustained blur, this is very, very important, it needs to be, become blurry and stay blurry. We're going to measure the distance from the card to the spectacle plane in centimeters and convert to diopters. So 100, say we measure 10 centimeters, that converts to 10 diopters. This is just our recording we're going to use. We need the test used with or without correction and which prescription through which we're testing. We are going to record amps and diopters. We do not record amps and centimeters. We need the right eye and left eye separately. So for example, AMP, push-up method, um, with correction, we found seven in both the left and the right eyes. What are the norms and what are we thinking about when we're analyzing this information? A good rule to follow is something called the one-half AMP in reserve. This means that we ex expect sustained, clear, and comfortable single vision when a patient's only using half of their AMPs during near work. Before we measure AMPs, just a word of caution, we need to always make sure to evaluate and correct for any undercorrected hyperopia, overcorrected myopia, or presbyopia. That can always affect our amplitude findings. And after we've ruled out these things, then we're gonna consider evaluating for an accommodative anomaly. There's, when we're thinking about norms for AMPs, Hofstetter's formula is a good rule to follow. It gives us average amps to expect and minimum to expect based on the patient's age. Typically use minimum when we're comparing our findings to um, the expected amps. It's just 15 minus a quarter of the patient's age and years. And we're gonna expect the patient is going to be comfortable when they have at least twice that or half that amp in reserve. So say our, their, our patient's reading at 40 centimeters, that's a 2.5 diopter accommodative demand. They need to have at least five diopters of accommodative amplitude in order to likely function comfortably. I'm just going to show you, this doesn't have any audio, I'm going to speak through it.
So they're measuring near visual acuity. They've measured the target. She's gonna have the patient focus on a line of letters that's one to two lines above her best corrected VA. Going to bring the card slowly towards the patient's eyes and the patient's going to report their first sustained blur. Okay. Patient reported blur. Going to measure from the spectacle plane to the card and convert that to diopters. So that was for the right eye. The procedure gets re repeated the same way for the left eye. Good. So now we've measured, we've looked at our virgences, we've looked at our accommodation, one technique to measure accommodation. Now we're gonna look at the ACA ratio linking accommodative and accommodation and virgins. What is the ACA ratio? It, use the, it uses the concepts of blur and convergence accommodation. Blur reflex is gonna be small changes in accommodation in response to the detection of blur. And virgence is stimulated by changing infusional virgence. So increasing accommodation is gonna increase your positive fusional virgence and decrease in accommodation is gonna decrease your positive fusional virgence. So the purpose of this is to determine the change in accommodative convergence that occurs when the patient increases the accommodation by a given amount. So the fusional virgence stimulus stays constant. Plus lenses are gonna relax accommodation and reflexively convergence is going to decrease. Plus lenses are gonna make exos larger, esos smaller. Minus lens, Minus lenses are gonna stimulate accommodation and we're going to expect convergence to increase. This is gonna make excess smaller, smaller and ESOs larger. What's the procedure? We're gonna re-measure the patient's near lateral foria using plus one or minus two lenses. We can just use flippers over the patient's habitual prescription and we're gonna use cover test to do so. We can also do this test in the phoropter and measure for phorias. We can use this with modified Thorington. There's several different ways. Cover test is quick, easy, and portable. So when we're doing this with plus and minus one, this is gonna force accommodation to change by one diopter. This is that A portion of the ACA ratio. We're gonna look at the differences between the two FOIA measures, measurements. This is gonna give the AC part, part of the ACA ratio. You can also use plus and minus two flippers. You just need to convert this ratio to, to whatever you find out of one. So say you found eight over two difference, that's gonna be a four out of one, four to one. So let's look at an example. So in refraction, we found minus two in both the right and the left eyes, the foria through the habitual, and found a four prism diopter exophoria. You may remeasure the foria through plus one flippers. Remember, this is going to relax accommodation, going to make exos larger. Found an eight exophoria. We're going to remeasure the foria through minus one, and we find ortho. So again, we came, we we stimulated accommodation, stimulated convergence, and now we're moving more ESO. So this gives us an ACA ratio of four to one. So what are the norms for ACA ratio? Normal is four to one to six to one. Low is anything under four to one, and high is anything greater than six to one. Really consider um, depending who you read, some people recommend using plus one all the time. I've read others that always recommend using minus one. But I think it's really important to do both plus and minus one because you can get an understanding if there's issues noted in either direction. The ratio should be the same regardless, but maybe the patient has more difficulty relaxing accommodation, more difficult with the plus side of things, or maybe they have problem stimulating accommodation and then an unequal ratio in either direction can give you clues to what's going on with the patient's accommodative convergence system. So I'm going to ask you a question here. 
So when measuring patients near foria using the cover test, you find a six prism diopter esophoria. And when we repeat the test using the plus two flippers, we are now finding a six prism diopter exophoria. What is the patient's HCA ratio and is it within norms? Great, so the answer is six to one because we need to reduce that ratio down. So the total difference is six ESO and the six EXO is a total difference of 12. We use the plus two, so that's 12 over two, but we write that as six to one, and that is not within norms. That would represent a high ACA ratio. So the last technique I'm gonna to cover today is a sensory status. There's lots of different stereo vision tests that we can use to um, measure sensory status. What is sensory fusion? It's testing the ability of the eyes to combine, combine sensory information such as form, color, illumination, location, and space from both the left and the right eyes into a single perception. So different information is being presented to each eye. How are our eyes combining this information? So stereopsis is the true depth perception, true binocular perception of depth, our eyes can also use monocular clues, but that's not a true depth perception. Just gonna cover quickly monocular depth cues so you have a better understanding of that. These are learned as a result of our interaction with the visual world. It's used by everyone for distance over 200 meters. We use such things internal cues, such as accommodation convergence, geometric perspective, light and shadow, to help clue us into the depth. We're gonna contrast that to normal stereopsis. So normal stereopsis is when we have two eyes that function normally and equally. There's that similar retinal images in both the left and the right eye. And we're gonna look at the motor fusion ability and how it relax, uh, interacts with sensory fusion to maintain bifovial fixation on the eyes to turn both those images into a single image. So motor fusion and sensory fusion are linked. We need both and any imbalance can lead to reduced stereopsis and binocularity. So I've gotten questions about the development of stereopsis. So I wanted to touch base on this. So any patient, um, children that might have strabismus in this, around this so-called critical period, around seven years, give or take, they're likely not to develop stereopsis normally unless they're caught and corrected early. So it's really important why we're doing this testing on younger individuals, all this binocular vision testing, because we want to pick up these and get them corrected so they can develop stereo normally. So adults, once that's, that stereopsis is set in, because they've had previous normal stereo, they'll, and they lose that stereo because of any strabismus, say. Once that strabismus is corrected because they had it previously, stereopsis is normally go is going to be restored. There is some new research related to neuroplasticity that suggests that the critical period may not fully be set in stone, and then adults may even lose stereopsis if strabismus is constant for two to three months. So just kind of stay up to date on this. There's a lot of new research coming out, but this is generally the case. So there's a large variety of stereovision testing. Polaroid filters are perhaps one of the more common. There's also color, color filters, variety of stereosco stereoscopes. So some of them are common are random.2, pass test, titmus fly, random.e. Any of these tests are okay to use. Just make sure you always read the instruction book in terms of the testing distance and um, the norms and the answers. So the level of stereopsis is measured by the angular separation of the target in seconds of arc. So smaller, smaller separation means smaller final retinal disparity and better stereo vision. We always need to test with a habitual correction for near. We might need to use some testing glasses, such as Polaroid glasses over the patient's glasses. 
or we need good overhead illumination with no glare. It's recommended that the practitioner hold the book at eye level without moving, so we can't induce any cues and get better stereo vision than they might otherwise have. Again, stressing the importance of reading the instructions, we need to use the correct distance that the test is calibrated for. A longer distance can artificially mean finer levels of stereo. How to record stereopsis. We need the test used with or without correction. Type of stereo applicable. Some te tests have both local and global, so you just need to record which one. The testing distance and we record the measurement in seconds of arcs. Stereopsis norms are variable per patient's age and type and test, but generally around 25 seconds of arc is considered good or normal. So just to summarize, we've learned a lot of different techniques today. I want you to be able to confidently complete testing for a binocular vision exam with cover test at both distance and near to determine phorias versus tropias. Near point of convergence, so your convergence, your vergence amplitude, and step prism bars or vergences. Test of accommodation we covered is amplitude, and then we looked at the accommodative convergence to accommodation ratio or ACA ratio. We also briefly touched base on sensory status using stereo vision. So my next lecture, we're just going to cover common binocular vision anomalies in patient cases, and my third lecture is going to cover some treatment options for these conditions. Thank you. It was great speaking with you today. Some reference. And do you have any questions for me today? Uh, thank you, Dr. Kaiser. We have about six questions. If you okay. want to yes. Stop your screen share and open up. Uh, it should be up top. If not, I can. No, oh, I'm not seeing it. Oh, there it is. So first question is, if the near, if the near target has a few lines of different size, how are you going to choose the target? So you're gonna measure the near visual acuity and you're gonna select a target that's one to two lines larger than the patient's best corrected BA. So if they're 2020, you're going to choose maybe around 2030. If they're 2030, you might choose a 2040 target to 2050. So you need to measure your near visual acuity first, and that's going to allow you to select the proper target. Okay. Then we had a question about monocular clues. Um, I tested the, I briefly touched on this in the stereopsis section. We don't really test monocular cues. We're gonna use the stereo vision um, booklets to test um, true depth perception rather than monocular clues. Good question. Next question is, if the patient is presbyopic, how do we check phorias or tropias at near? Again, I can't stress this enough. This is why we need a full, accurate, mo maximum plus prescription, and the patient needs to be adequately corrected for near. So you do this with their habitual near glasses on, so they should be wearing glasses that fully correct them for near, and then you um, are gonna retest the phoria are going to check the foria when they're fully corrected so they should be able to see the target. And again, you're going to measure near visual acuity before you do the cover test findings. I had a question about tropias in adults versus children. I'm going to cover this more in lecture three when I talk about management. 
This is a good question. Next question is, which eye should we present the prism in front of? I'm assuming we're talking about measuring our virgences with the step prism. Because the eyes are yoked and work together, we can do either eye. We just always need to measure base in before base out. So we can do either eye. You'll notice if you just want to do it in both just to kind of learn, that the answer will be the same in both eyes. So we only put it in front of, it doesn't matter which eye. By convention, I typically always use the right eye. Another good question, is there any difference between measuring accommodation with letters and picture targets? It's a great question. So if we're using picture targets, that's not necessarily a great control of accommodation, but it, it's, it's appropriate usually for children. So you wouldn't want to use picture targets necessarily for adults. You might you want to use more of a tumbling E or a letter target. Picture targets with children, we just need to get them to attend to the target and pay attention. So those are more appropriate, but it's ideal to use letters. Got a question using um, step fusional virgins or smooth fusional virgins. Step fusional virgins is with the prism bars and free space. Smooth fusional virgins is in the fractor. I do prefer step fusional virgins because it's an objective and subjective test where smooth fusional virgins in the fractor is only subjective. We're relying only on the patient's response. But with the prism, I'm able to see when my patient's eyes lose fixation. So in a child, it's particularly helpful or someone that might not ex understand the explanation or the test or able to follow directions. I do prefer step fusional virgins because I can see as the provider what is going on and I'm not able to do so if the patient's behind the fractor. I'm also getting a lot of questions about um, stereopsis and glaucoma. That's a little outside of the scope of this lecture. I will try to cover this briefly in the management of binocular vision conditions, but a little outside of the lecture for today, um, speaking about glaucoma.